today on Government Matters, addressing readiness issues for Coast Guard operations, a conversation with the department's commandant. A hiring blitz underway at the IRS procurement office. My conversation with the agency's acquisition leader about the progress her department is making. And the number one story of the week, examining security protocols at the Department of Homeland Security, the agency's response system, and what it means for the future of national security. Government Matters starts right now. From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. Welcome to the weekend edition of Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news, trends, and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. Last week, the Government Matters team attended the Navy League Sea Air Space Conference. My colleague Marjorie Sensor spoke with Admiral Carl Schultz, Commandant of the Coast Guard. Here's a look at that conversation. Admiral, thanks for joining me. Um, you've talked about the Coast Guard being as busy as it's ever been. What's driving that? Well, I'll tell you, Marjorie, I think it's a little bit of everything. You know, when you think about um, an organization with 11 statutory missions, enabling the prosperity of the nation and across our 361 ports, 25,000 25, nautical miles of waterways. There's a lot going on. Shipping is increasing in its size, the complexity. So we have regulatory roles. You think about it, it's been a little bit of a sidestep with COVID for the cruise industry, but cruise is hugely popular in the United States across the globe, and that'll be ramping back up. Um, new forms of energy. We've got uh, offshore wind getting energized like never before, no pun intended. LNG fuels, a lot of things there. Um, Americans have taken to the waterways here as a, as a safe form of recreational activity here during the global pandemic. So we got about a 15% uptick in search and rescue cases. And then the demand signal from the geographic combatant commanders across the world. We are truly a blue water global coast guard and, uh, and we're doing things in the Arabian Gulf, in the high latitudes, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the counter drug mission, Indo-Pacific. There's just a lot of demand for Coast Guard. It's a good problem to have, and it's my job to sort of press in to our, to our overseers and, and make the business case for appropriate funding for the service. It certainly seems like a challenge, though, to address readiness, which I know has been yes. an area of focus. How do you think about that when you're, you know, dealing with this level of demand? Yeah, there's, there's that balance of, you know, you're trying to solve a readiness problem that you're sort of dragging with you. It's like dragging a big caboose on the train. And I think what we, we've done with some degree of success and support from former and current administrations from the Hill is, is sort of identified that there is in fact a readiness problem there a little bit. You know, in those years after sequestration dating back to 2013, we lost about 10 percent purchasing power and I don't want to get budget wonky, but in the operating budget that supports our people, that supports training, 10 percent is a pretty tough cut. We should have been growing about 3 to 5 percent to really be a healthy Coast Guard. So we're playing catch up there, a lot of old infrastructure. We are a disaggregated service, you know, unlike an army base, Fort Hood, with 33,000 plus or minus people, we're 42,000 humans spread across the Coast Guard in many small units. So, you know, 10 child development centers supporting a 42,000 person workforce and family. So some of our challenges are unique, but I think we're having the right conversations to start to buy down that readiness risk a little bit. It, it, it needs to be, you know, a decade plus in the coming of, of steady trajectory on the, on the budget front. But uh, I'm encouraged with the direction we're heading. Uh, there's a new tri-service maritime strategy. Can we talk Correct. a little bit about sure. what that means for the Coast Guard? Yeah, so uh, Monday I did a panel with the CNO, Mike Gilday, Admiral Gilday, and the Commandant Marine Corps, uh, General Dave Berger. And the tri-service maritime strategy advantage, you see, it really talks about integrated all-domain naval power. And, you know, where does the Coast Guard fit in with, uh, with our Navy brethren and Marine Corps brethren? It, it talks purposely about, you know, we're unique. We're a law enforcement agency. You know, we're not a big service. We're the smallest. Marines are four plus sometimes bigger than us, but I think we bring, you know, some ability to have a conversation about how do, you know, naval forces, Coast Guard forces around the world follow the rules-based order, what does maritime governance look like. Um, we've stepped up our game in terms of illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. We can talk about what responsible behavior is. We regulate our U.S. fleet. You know, some other flag states have their fishermen fishing, you know, thousands of vessels fishing across the globe in, a, in an unregulated very minimal flag state role. So I think we bring a lot of there there. I think we've got national security cutters that have been operating in the Seventh Fleet area, a one that's sailed there right now on the Arabian Gulf. I think the Coast Guard just brings a credible tool in that toolbox of national security capabilities to the conversation. Where are you in executing that that strategy? Um, well, we are, we're doing. I mean, I, like I said, I, I kind of talk about the say-do gap. We're talking about 
the value the Coast Guard brings that we're trying to immediately to do behind it. You know, with the Arctic, the high latitudes, you know, we are woefully lacking. We have one, you know, 46-year-old heavy icebreaker that essentially is a one-trick pony. That'll go down to Antarctica. Last year, we had the unique opportunity to send it to the Arctic for a couple months because the McMurdo mission in Antarctica was stood down with COVID. They just didn't want to take the risk and go down there. But for the foreseeable future, Polar Star will go to Antarctica, resupply McMurdo. There's a big Antarctic infrastructure modernization program where they're recapitalizing. That's critically important. The good news is we're building a fleet of new icebreakers, polar security cutters, and uh, we have funded for two of the, the three ship program. I think there's a conversation maybe about more. So, you know, what we're doing is we are executing talking about it and executing where we can. Uh, I mentioned in my previous session um, being on the, um, the Black Sea mm -hmm. with a national security cutter. We've got nine of 11 ships delivered, fast response cutters, two of six in the Arabian Gulf replaced. That's a program of total record 64, 58 domestic. So we're doing a lot and we're, and we're sort of rolling the strategy as we're, uh, as we're executing it. I also want to talk a little bit about um, climate change, which has been a yep. real priority for the Biden administration. How does that affect uh, the Coast Guard, which obviously is, is everywhere and sees yeah, a lot more I, I would, let, me, let me kind of talk it too. So let's go back to the high latitudes for a second. You know, the ice extent, the amount of ice there, fast ice. You know, if you go back and look over the last decade and a half, couple of decades, it's, it's, there's less ice than that. But people say, well, maybe you don't need icebreakers. Arguably, when there's less fast ice, more moving ice, you arguably need more icebreakers. So we see climatological change having an impact. You know, there's open routing in the Arctic to, to an unprecedented um, level now. So you see shipping companies looking at, can you potentially do cargo deliveries across the northern sea route? You could take a ship from Shanghai that travels through the Suez Canal, maybe knock 11, 12 days off that transit. The Russians are looking at creating a toll road across the northern sea route with heavy icebreaker escort. Wow. You know, we are paying attention to that. We're looking at, could the Arctic present a contested space in terms of freedom of navigation, things like that. So that's one place. Domestically, um, as we talk about sort of old infrastructure, as we build new infrastructure across the country, you know, areas like Miami, Norfolk, big Coast Guard presence there, those are some of the areas really that they're paying a lot of attention to seawater rise. So we're factoring into what is uh, modernizing our facilities look like? What's the best science there? How do we think about the next century? Of course, you know, we build something, we tend to get a lot of miles out of it. So we're very much informing our, our engineering work. And then we're looking at um, working in the international arena. I represent um, the maritime interest of the nation at International Maritime Organization, I know the UN organization. You know, there's a drive to lower emissions fuels and, and, and how do we drive down the uh, you know, the, the climatological risks from energy and, and, and the, um, the byproducts of that. So there's a lot of things going on, I think, that puts the Coast Guard right in the, the wheelhouse of this conversation about climatological change and, uh, and the way forward. Absolutely. Thanks so much for joining me, Admiral. Thank you for the question, Margie. Thanks. Coming next, a hiring blitz underway at the IRS Procurement Office. Straight ahead on Government Matters, my discussion with the agency's acquisition leader about her department's progress. You're watching 7 News. Unpaid taxes could reach $7 trillion in the next decade. The White House recommends that the IRS respond by revamping its workforce and modernizing its networks. Shanna Webers is the Chief Procurement Officer at the IRS. Shanna, welcome. Thanks, Mimi. It's great to be here. Boom, drop the mic. Procurement's in the house. <laughs> You've said that you're hiring 80 new people in your office. What's driving the need for all these new hires? Well, it's really fantastic news, and part of it is a recognition of the value and the enabling capability that the procurement team brings to executing the IRS mission. Really, there's not a lot that we can do on our own without in bringing our industry partners in to help us modernize our systems. And so this is an opportunity for us in the procurement space to also modernize procurement operations as we continue to enable the, the IRS in general in total to include IT to modernize. So how do you make sure that you're getting the best people with the right skills? Well, you know, it's awful difficult, but one of the things is being on shows like this, right, to spread the word that we want the best of the best. That's what we're looking for. And really, we are pushing hard to, again, transform our organization. We embark on a game-changing strategy recently to really embrace speed innovation 
and agility, right? We can't continue to do business as usual and expect different results. And so we are turning a lot of our historical processes upside down. And I need people who are willing to come in and make a difference. People who feel curious, who feel bold and who feel brave to make a positive difference. So as you mentioned, the IRS is modernizing its systems. What's your office's role and how do you manage such a large task and also, how do those new hires come into play for that new task? Right, we play a critical role in that modernization scheme, right? And so part of what we need to do is understand the path of where our IT colleagues are going. We need to understand what their modernization plan is. We need to be able to accurately articulate that to industry so that they understand what our needs are and they can let us know what the niche capabilities are that they can provide to us to really step out of the box and go big in our modernization initiatives. And so part of what we would need to do in that space as well is to look at our processes within procurement. How do we streamline our processes? We have an initiative called Pilot IRS, and that is a procurement method that is an agile approach to incrementally identifying emerging technologies and verify that they actually fit within our architecture and then we can scale up. So that's one of the ways that we in procurement are specifically enabling the IT and the IRS for the modernization. So tell me about some of the successes that you've had at your office that can be shared with other agencies in government. Well, one of those is the um, pilot IRS. We have been sharing those. We've actually been coaching other Treasury bureaus on how to do that process, especially in those instances where they've had some dis difficulty bringing in emerging technologies. Another thing that we are doing is is helping our customers define what their requirement is. You know, that's really hard. And a lot of times it's easy to say, give me your requirement, but figuring out what your requirement is hard and ensuring that it's translated into language that our industry partners across the board can understand. And so one of the things that we've done is created a front door capability where we are actually digging in hand in hand with our requirements owners to help them with their package. So when it gets to the contracting specialist and the contracting officer, then they can be more rapid in in the process to actually getting to award and we're also doing a por cap cap portfolio capability capability <laughs> yeah go so ahead that, you can talk about that <laughs> thanks and so that is where to to implement a large program for example the enterprise case management and our digitalization portfolio normally we would just get one contract at a time and we would not be able to necessarily connect the dots on on the timing the sequencing the dependencies of all of these various contracts and by having that holistic picture of the contracts that are needed to implement a large scale program are allowing us to make better strategic determinations on what the acquisition strategy should be, how we can sequencing those to ensure that there's no lapse in service and that there's a smooth transition from one vendor to the next. So those are two examples. I'm interested, Chana, in your, um, your metrics for, for success. How do you know that you're actually being successful in the training, uh, the hiring, the training, the retaining of new employees, the modernization, everything. You know, I think that's a hard metric, right? One of the areas that I've been pushing my staff is return on investment. For the 80 people that we've been authorized to hire, how do we show that return on investment to the organization that that was a good investment in their dollars? And so we are exploring different ways. We're working with industry on, on doing that. With regard to other metrics internally in our organization, we are, focused on machine learning and AI like most other organizations in the federal government. An example would be, we recently created a web application that will predict the contract award date. And so, you know, everybody wants to know when is the contract gonna be signed? And this is an automated way using a lot of data that can actually predict that with a, about a 30 day window. And we're continuing to refine that to mirror that time frame down. Shannon, I want to thank you so much for being on the program and best of luck with your hiring blitz. Thanks, Mimi. Fantastic. It's good to see you. Good to be here. Good to see you. Coming next, the number one story of the week, reviewing special event protocols at the Department of Homeland Security. Straight ahead on Government Matters, what it means for the future of national security. You're watching 7 News.
Now the number one story of the week. The Government Accountability Office recommends that the, the Department of Homeland Security rework its security protocols following the January 6th attack on the Capitol. DHS has specific protocols to respond to special events that require increased security. Triana McNeil is Director of Homeland Security and Justice Issues at GAO. Triana, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Mimi. What were the report's main findings? So we, we had two findings and two related recommendations. First, there were three key events that happened on January 6th, and none of them were deemed um, a, nat a national special security event. Um, and so we have a recommendation for DHS to uh, increase factors that it uses to make these designations. And what we're wanting them to do is add context and current threat environment to its list of factors as it makes those decisions. And the second finding is related to the confusion over who can request a special security designation in the District of Columbia on federal property. We started this review in February, and until today, there's still a lot of confusion from federal partners as well as local entities about who can request that designation. So our recommendation is simply for DHS to clarify its policy and to communicate that information on its public facing website, for example, just to make it clear to its partners who has the responsibility and authority to make such a request. Before we get too far into actual recommendations, I want to ask you about time frame, because I, I want to understand how long do these designations typically take when the process works? So according to DHS, they need quite a bit of lead time uh, to consider the different factors, make the designation, develop a security plan, and put that plan in place and marshal all the necessary resources. However, in 2015, uh, the Pope came to visit and had changed the itinerary for its travels in the U.S. at the last minute. And DHS was able to be dynamic and make certain changes to make sure there was enhanced security for those additional stops for the Pope. So we know they can be nimble. Well, let's talk, let's go back to your, your recommendations and, and talk about how DHS can really clarify that guidance that's needed to prepare and coordinate, because that was also a big issue for potential future events like that January 6th attack. Sure, so the policy that it uses to make determinations if an event should be an NSSE, which is a national special security event, those factors need to be updated. I think that's very simple, that's easy to do. That's just an internal document. Um, the other recommendation related to updating um, the guidance on who can make a request to start this process, that also is an easy fix. All you need to do is make those updates to the policy. Has DHS made a response to your report and your recommendations? They have. Um, they do not agree uh, with our recommendations, which we, we found somewhat disturbing um, because they are really easy lifts for them to update the guidance, push that out, and update um, the factors used to make the determinations about these events. I think the biggest challenge for DHS and others are to see things that used to be routine, normal business, like the certification of a presidential election. That may not be routine business anymore. And so they need to see these things as potentially, they need to get pre-designated as NSSEs to even prevent any of this waiting for someone to request. They, they can get a jump on that and start planning and, and making those security um, enhancement. And Triana, are you gonna be following up with this or is there other things that you're gonna be looking at in on this subject? Yes, this is the first of multiple products that GAO will be issuing in the coming months. Uh, my portfolio covers intelligence sharing uh, and so I will have a couple of more products focused on the use of social media 
and the use um, of intelligence by partners and the sharing of that information. There's another product that will be focused on how they use the intelligence to make security enhancements on the Capitol complex. And then the last product that we will issue is based on the Capitol Police and their use of force. Terrific. Triana, thanks so much for coming on the show. This is definitely a subject we would like to follow up with you and with Homeland Security about. Thanks again. Happy to be here. Thank you. Don't forget, if you miss an episode of Government Matters, it's at govmatters.tv. And we want to hear what you think of the program or any of the topics we discuss. Find us on social media and send us your comments. We're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Send us your comments. I'll be back in two minutes. That's the latest from Washington. Join me weeknights at 8 and 11 on WJLA 24-7 News and next Sunday morning at 1030 on 7 News to stay plugged in on the issues that matter to the business of government. Thanks for watching. I'm Mimi Gerges.